everyone, sorry for the delay. Um, my name is Gagan, and my presentation topic is on stem cell based treatments. So, to understand how stem cells can be applied in different medical and regenerative medicine treatments, we have to first define what a stem cell is. So, you can read this giant explanation, or basically, what a stem cell is. is it's a cell which can give rise to multiple different cell lines, depending on if it's multipo uh, pluripotent, multipotent, or omnipotent, and that impacts how many different cells it can differentiate into. So basically, it's just one cell that can become different things. I'm sure many of you biology students know that already. And what I'm focusing on specifically is how stem cells can help treat burn victims. And by burn victims specifically, I'm looking at how stem cells can help aid in the maintenance of skin grafts for third degree burn victims. So by that, we'd be transplanting follicular stem cells and spacious glands into these grafts to help in the maintenance of them. So here we have what a skin graft is. So essentially the skin graft is, is, an, is a, a patch of skin removed from some point on the burn victim's body or a donor. And essentially this graft is significantly larger than the, the wound that it's supposed to cover. And this is due to the fact that after a while, skin a cell death occurs because it's not fat. The tissue isn't vascularized the same way as it would be on a normal individual because all the underlying um, material is gone. It's not being able to be supported the right way. As well as moisture loss allows for the contraction of the skin over time. So over time, skin is noticeably different, and it becomes a lot more brittle and is more pr prone to mechanical and failure and from stress and other things. So why third degree burn victims? So here we have different burn types yeah, with their in increasing severity as we go down. So first and second degree burns result in basically pain and redness of the skin. And second degree burns provide significant damage to the epidermis and dermal layers. Third degree burns, on the other hand, they, they destroy the, the dermis and reach the underlying subcutaneous membrane. And this is, this is why they're so damaging. This is why skin grafts and other um, more intense treatment methods are needed, such as intravenous antibiotics and maybe possibly even synthetic skin, is because the underlying material that's supposed to support the uh, follicular stem cells and, and just hair in general is, is destroyed. First and second degree burns can be treated with antibiotics and other ointments, which can be prescribed, but third degree burns have to have a lot more intensive care that goes into their treatment. So here we have an example of um, the hair follicle balls, which is like a single unit that gives rise to different, um, different, different integral parts of the pilosebaceous unit, which I'll explain later. So, this, this me mesenchymal cells underneath the hair, uh, uh, along with the bulge stem cells, are responsible for the generation of the hair in and of itself. Adjacent to this, we see the sebaceous glands, and these are responsible for the secretion of this liquid called sebum, and the sebum is, is what lubricates the skin itself. So. There are two types of sebaceous glands, ones that are connected to the hair follicle, such as this, and in pilosebaceous units, which I'll be explaining later on, they're, it's just, they're situated differently. So here we see how the sebum propagates the surface in a schematic view of the hair follicle and the follicles over here. And here we just see what makes up the pilosebaceous unit in and of itself. So this part over here and this part as a whole, which is then shown here in this histological diagram. So this is made up of two parts, the sebaceous gland and the hair follicle. Um, and the sebaceous glands provide oil and are present everywhere in the body except on the hands and feet because our hands and feet don't grow hair. So this poses an issue for potential stem cell treatments in these locations as these areas also ex experience the most mechanical stress and they have to be the most ductile in order to uh, move and pick up things and and go about in your day-to-day -day life. So in terms of, in these locations, the uses of, these, of the transplantation of these glands and these stem cells wouldn't be as effective as one would hope. So we have to look for alternatives in this area. And so essentially, what the, what the purpose of this is, of, of the transplantation of, the, of these glands is to, to moisturize this top layer. Because this top layer is what's responsible for interacting with the environment. This top layer is what cracks most often in, when, when, skin skill, when skin grafts are employed. So now I'm going to talk about a few studies that I used in the production of this presentation. So first of all, I'm just talking about what epithelial cells are, which I'm sure many of you know, but it's integral to the explanation of my, 
presentation. So the epithelia in general are made up of sheets of tightly linked cells that make up the surface of the epidermis and other linings of the body. At these locations, the epithelia provide a layer against external environments and also regulate the absorption of, the wa of water, nutrients, and other factors and secretions from different glands, such as sebum from the sebaceous gland. The epithelia needs to be constantly replaced. In skin grafts, that not, that's not always possible. And they, they cycle through different... The, the replacement of epithelia depends on where the cells are located. For example, the cells in the lung may take up to six months to be replaced, while hair cells cycle through constant growth, degeneration, and replacement continuously. So unless the mesenchymal layer in a, a hair follicular bo follicle bunch is damaged, most tissue in which this is implemented can regenerate to approximately the same strength and um, yet yeah, approximately the same strength and top topographical features as, as initially present. So understanding the promise by which but epithelial stem cells aid in the regeneration of skin tissue grafts is, is an essential factor in understanding how stem cells can be utilized in skin grafts in burn patients. Follicular stem cells located in the bulge region can give rise to any one of these cells located nearby. So now here's a more direct example of sebaceous gland transplantation. This has been done by Dr. Elwell Butcher at the University of New York. So in this study, sebaceous glands were transplanted into the under the skin of a rat and hair growth was observed at the location from which the transplantation occurred, that being the peritoneal cavity. So the conclusions from the study is that, that normal hair growth occurred at any one of these transplantations of any one of these sacs. And Dr. Butcher described them as quite normal. So there was nothing distinguishing them from growth on any other parts of this animal. Hair follicles with pedicels to the surface, and that is uh, essentially a tip to the surface, any connection to the surface were, were, had higher chances of survival, so they were able to propagate and produce sebum and, and become parts of the individual. However, covering any part of the skin or um, so glands that were transplanted farther into the skin with no pedicels to the surface died off a lot faster. So this becomes an issue when we're dealing with burned patients because there's the trade-off between being able to cover up a wound and making it sterile and keeping it that way and preventing the propagation of these potential transplanted stem cells. So, as this was studied in a, in a rat model a few years ago, it's important to see how this future research can transition to humans and if it becomes accredited in humans. So, as Dr. Morell was my advisor, it makes sense for me to talk about how his work can be used in tandem with the stem cell therapies that I'm talking about. So, essentially, the contaminated wound that burn victims have is often very difficult to deal with because it requires constant treatment and, and redressing, undressing the wound, which causes not only pain for the victim, but also stress and strain on the medical healthcare system because you have to make specific appointments to maybe see doctors and to basically verify if the wound is infected or if it's, if it's healing effectively, which, which, is, which is also tiresome for the doctor and the patient as well. So the antibacterial properties of nanocrystalline silver have the, have the ability to rapidly increase the healing process. And this is due to the fact that it, they decrease <coughs> the amount of matrix metallic proteinases, which basically the, uh, a higher number of these respond to a decrease in the, an, an increase. So if there's more present, there's an increase in the amount of time it takes for a wound to heal. So we're uh, using nanocrystalline silver and we see that in sites in a porcine model in which nanocrystalline silver is employed, these matrix metalloproteinases decrease, as well as using this in a few days, the skin becomes vascularized enough to support a healthy graft. So in essence, this is an, an initial step to, to which we can then use stem cell therapies to speed up the whole treatment process as a whole. This would be our first step, employing this technology to not only increase the rate at which tissue heals, but increase how effectively it heals and as well this technology isn't that expensive to, to basically employ in, in burn victims and such. So the primary use of this nanocrystalline silver in for burn patients would be the revascularization of the underlying tissue. So there are inherent ethical issues with stem cell research. So I think that stem cell research offers new hope and great promise for understanding of various diseases. And the greatest ethical debate, I think, surrounds stem cells is, is misdirected Sorry, 
uh, which types of stem cells are being researched. And here I have a, a graph uh, chart rather from a paper that was published in uh, the national, um, I think it was PubMed from two professors at the University of Rochester, sorry if I butchered that, uh, dealing with human embryonic cell cells, stem cells and different ethical issues surrounding that. But I think that the ethical concerns aren't the biggest issue. I think it's the fact that there's public misinformation about how stem cells are obtained and how stem cell research goes about. And this is due, I think, to the large debate on the onset of personhood, and I'm not going to get into that. But in terms of scientific weight, I feel like oftentimes these debates carry no legitimate weight. And I chose to focus on follicular stem cells and transplantation in that regard, because first of all, it's a non-invasive, more or less measure. And this provides a more holistic standpoint from which we can determine if stem cell therapy is that effective. Using this without being involved in the ethical debate. So currently there's yeah. So currently there is extensive research conducted into various e areas involving stem cell therapies and treatment. A significant obstacle obstacle to even more potential research is the ethical debate surrounding stem cells obtained from umbilical cords and fetuses. The most effective method by which research in this area can become commonplace is by public education and information campaigns. This immense promise brought by the past and present research and achievements done in stem cell um, in the area of stem cells with even more potent sorry <laughs> with even more potent stem cells would allow for the greater understanding and treatment of more harmful illnesses in the future. Regenerative medicine will continue to be an expanding field whether society embraces it as a whole or not. And uh, it embraces it and the technological advances. Oh, oh. Sorry. <laughs> Regenerative medicine will continue to be a constantly expanding field while society as a whole embraces a whole scale technical advan technological advancements it brings with it. I feel like this quote is very applicable to this area of research because there will always be individuals who are very skeptic about where research is taking us, where we're moving towards the society. However, this, this change is bound to happen. And as we approach more and more not necessarily intrusive, but more and more um, interventionist measures in regenerative medicine, stuff that can, I guess, stuff that is ethically questionable today in the future, but has the ability to treat multiple different types of diseases, types that, diseases that couldn't be treated today, like, such as genetic, genetic diseases that we don't have the technology to currently treat. With stem cell therapy, I feel as though th that's bound to happen after a certain amount of time. I feel as though these techniques will be developed, but it's just a matter of time. And whether these individuals choose to or not, I feel like that's just a measure of like natural selection. It's like the idea of if vaccines cause autism. Those individuals that choose not to embrace vaccines, we, we've seen what happens in the news with all these individuals that choose not to vaccinate their children and such. In a similar sense, these stem cell therapies will become, I believe, more commonplace, such as vaccines, in preventing, preventing disease as a whole. So both the main types of regenerative medicine I've talked about is something inanimate, such as nanocrystal and silver, and then stem cell therapies. And both of them have made imp impressive strides in the area of wound healing and regenerative medicine. For brain victims, the research that has been done could bring new hopes uh, for e an easier wound to take care of, an easier skin graft to take care of, and would allow them to build, live a more normal lifestyle where they ha won't have to worry about the mechanical stress experienced by their graft and if they have to continue getting new grafts, and which, which will also play a role into it increased costs on the healthcare systems where we have to look for new potential donors if the, if the individual cannot donate skin from a certain part of the body or if transplantations are not possible in that regard. So the continued advancements will provide an increased quality of treatment for pa patients. Burn victims in particular will see a substantial increase in their quality of life and, they will, and it is possible that this technology becomes employed in humans in the next coming decade due to the increase in stem cell research and the and not in just humans, just in other animal models as a whole, other mammals. So the most substantial left hurdle left for the implementation of stem cell therapies into a larger medical field is the ac accreditation and approval of these treatments and therapies for use in a clinical setting. The effective is the most stem cell therapies. Treatments have been established in various studies and their transition towards clinical implementation with of these techniques will be sure to happen in the coming years. In particular, we're not far from the treatment of burn victims 
by using stem cells and other regenerative medicine techniques. And it, with these advances, we are decreasing the repeat need for physician intervention. And regenerative medicine, we, uh, <laughs> we are decreasing the need for physician intervention. And I would like to end off, well, partially end off with this quote from William James Mayo, one of the original founders of the Mayo Clinic. And that is, the aim of medicine is to prevent disease and prolong life. The ideal of medicine is to eliminate the need of physician. If individuals are not falling sick that often and are able to maintain more of their own personal diseases to, to them for the most part by using these regenerative medicine techniques, which will probably still be employed by and used by physicians in a large part, which will be, I guess, yeah, employed by physicians. They'll have to spend less time at the physician's office and less time getting treatment, and these treatments will be proved to be far more effective. As well, these treatments can have a diagnostic property or you can be used in a diagnostic way. So they can catch potential diseases and ailments earlier on. So if it's a genetics disposition, for example, using stem cell therapies, we're, we're able to correct that a lot earlier on, which would prevent the propagation of more disease, which would cause a strain in the healthcare system. But back to what I focus on specifically, which is trying to keep ethics out of this. In terms of aiding people who are third degree burn victims with stem cell therapies, I believe that has immense promise in the coming, coming decade. Thank you. So for burn victims, you know how you lose feeling? In yes. Your, would these people be able to feel again? So or is it thing. just like a replacement? It's basically, so the revascularized tissue doesn't just repropagate the damaged nerves. So the nerves are gone. Yeah. But it would, even though they have no sensation left in this part of their skin, it would be, it would be more normalized. So it, it wouldn't prevent them in their day-to-day -day life. However, yeah, they, st they still wouldn't be able to feel. They would be able to grow hair, and like it would be just a normal part of their body, but they would still not have any sensation. Yeah. So would it be the same texture too? That depends on if it's where it's transplanted from, of course, right? So if if the if the follicular stem cells which are implanted are from the specific patient, on say on the other arm, for example, over time they will develop to be about the same. But the the underlying issue is the skin graft, where the skin graft is from. If the skin is from the thigh and scrapped it onto the arm, it's not going to be the same, right? And that, that depends on if it's even from this patient. Because if this patient has burns all over their body, they're not going to be able to graft something that's not there. So that also depends on which donor it's from, right? So it depends on multiple factors. Oh, um, so do you think it'll be easy, you talked a lot about using it for burn victims and skin grafts, do you think it'll be easy for scientists to make the jump to stem cell treatments for um, organ failures and organ transplants and things like that? Or is that sort of still considered a separate issue? So that depends, I think, on two things. So I feel like stem cell research on skin, first of all, it's non-invasive. So I think it's a lot easier than, say, main, like approving things for internal use because we don't really know what's going on there. Like, as a patient or individual going around in their daily lives, we don't know the propagation of how stem cells are used. Also, I feel like there's a greater ethical hurdle, hurdle to that because where are these specific stem cells obtained from for internal use? Are they obtained from other individuals that are living or are they obtained from umbilical cords of fetuses which are more um, omnipotent in nature? So I would, I would hope that this technology gets developed more for brain victims or for, uh, for the epidermis as a whole first, like the external epidermis, I'm not talking about lungs or anything, because I feel like this will show that it has promise and if it's approved by clinicians, I feel like it'll make jump towards more internal uses of stem cell therapies a lot more easier. Yes? So, uh, so like, a uh, skin uh, graft from, like, let's say, difference between getting it from a patient or, like, a donor, is there, like, a more preferred method? And what's the, diff what's the difference? I mean, for most of the papers I've read, they try to graft from that individual because, first of all, I, I mean, there's less of a chance of rejection. I know that's not that big of an issue for skin grafts because skin grafts aren't really hard to obtain because you can just graft another thing. It's not like internal organs where we only have a certain amount of we can regenerate skin more or less. But I think it's preferred that it's from the same individual just because of the, the issue of rejection and stuff. And also the fact of the matter is I feel like if it is from yourself, just like psychologically, you'll take more care of your own skin than if it's a donor skin. I could be wrong, but based off that, I feel like 
your own skin is preferred. Yes. Um, I'm just wondering if you got a sense in your research um, about embryonic stem cells. Obviously, most of the ethical controversy is about surrounding that. that. So, do we? Do you think that we lose uh, potentially beneficial things if we um, focus our work on non-embryonic stem cells or um, like other stem cells, which are yeah. okay? So. I feel as though like the end goal is always pushing towards embryonic stem cells because I feel like they have the greatest chance of impacting stem cell treatments. However, as an ethicist, I'm sure you understand like there's a large pushback in embryonic stem cells and other surrounding treatments surrounding fetuses and bone cords, such like such as that. So I feel as though as a society they will slowly push towards that. And I feel like focusing on other stem cells, we are definitely losing out on potentially getting access to I guess more life-saving treatments earlier on. However, socially, I feel like this is the more acceptable route to take. I feel like society will embrace it more whole scale, and which will open the doors for potential stem cell treatments based on embryos in the future. So, so we might be losing. We some. might be losing it, but in the long run, I, I believe that establishing the basis from this model would be useful. Okay, thanks. Any other right. questions? Okay, thank you very much. Oh, well, 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 well. oh sorry, sorry. Yeah. Um, so you talked about, you had one study that talked about rats. And yes. You did um, uh, stem cell transplants in rats. Do you think, uh, how, like, how easily is the results from that study transferable to humans? So like, is there differences between the skins in rats and humans? Okay, so like, the most common example would be like, if, if we did a porcine model, that's like the most applicable to towards human skin. However, no one's done that in porcine model or in humans yet, so we're not sure how these results will transfer, but there is hope for it because it, it's been effective in other mammals, not just rats, other small mammals as well. So I, I, I would assume that it would still work, but we don't know how effective it would be in human skins and different grafts and different skin types. Like there's a lot of different factors that take into account and where the follicular stem cells come from, what donors. There's a lot of different factors involved, but within the rat experiment, it's shown that there's immense I guess support for continued research in that area. Yes. Yeah. Is there a way for in the near future to culture undifferentiated cells rather than having to extract them from umbilical cords or uh, transplant them from other? So, are you talking about for use outside of burn victims, right? Yeah. So, I believe that there has been a study published recently in which scientists reversed fat cells to become stem cells. So, like you, you we can review or change the cellular processes. To, to, to basically make cells go retrograde, I guess, to become stem cells, and we can employ this in different uses. But in terms of making cells that are identical to embryos, I'm not sure about that. Mm -hmm. I guess one good clone, but that's a different issue altogether in terms of cell compatibility and such. Okay, okay. so thank you. Oh, <laughs>